thankful for the amazing grace of God. Amen. God's amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Amen. Amen. It saved a wretch like me. You know, uh, some of the new hymnals, <laughs> they changed that word wretch. to saved a one like me. Mm -mm, not me, buddy. When God saved me, he saved a wretch. Amen. Amen. Paul said the same thing. Amen. <laughs> Amen. He said he was the chief of sinners. Um, I'm amazed at how people uh, look at themselves in such a positive light. And then they look at God in such a negative light. You got that thing backwards, bud. <laughs> yeah, right. Amen. When God sees you, he sees a sinner that needs a Savior. Yeah. How do you see yourself? Amen. Um, I was uh, posting some stuff yesterday, and I'm amazed, man. I'm, I'm telling you, this, this, this Facebook stuff, wants, it makes me want to puke. You hear me? People have gotten on this thing and just, um, they become experts on everything. You know, they, they become an expert on telling you how you ought to talk. <laughs> Amen. You put something simple on Facebook and they come behind it. Like, for example, I put up there, we had a great day street preaching yesterday. We had a great time, blah, blah, blah. Somebody come behind that and say, well, what scripture do you, did you use? Listen, stupid, I used the Bible and I used a bunch of scriptures that you probably ain't even heard of because you ain't got time to read the Bible because you're too busy with your nose and Facebook. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I get so sick of these people wanting to always be the spiritual police. They find fault with every little thing somebody says. And then they get in there and they do nothing for God. They do nothing in, 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 in church for anybody. But they want to tell you how everything's supposed to go. Mm. Boy, they rubbed my feathers the wrong way, man. And I'll tell you exactly how I feel. It's a good thing they're changing the name Facebook to its true name, uh, Meta. M-E-T-A is what the new name is coming. Uh, you know what that means in Hebrew? Dead. Well, that's, that's a Hebrew word for dead. That's very fitting. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you got it right, Zuckerberg. <laughs> yeah. Keep that name going because you're letting people know exactly what you're about. All right. Um, I digress. Take your Bible and let's go to Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4. Listen, there ain't a person in this church that's perfect. There ain't a person in this church that ain't got issues and problems. There ain't a person in this church that has got it all figured out and all worked out and all right. Now, amen. Amen. We need to encourage one another and be a blessing to one another and, and uh, help each other when we see uh, things going on. You know, just pray. I'd be skeptical all the time, you know. I've been doing this for a long time. I've been I've been preaching since 19, 1989. That's a long time. I've been preaching for a long time, and I've seen these sopheads, these religious. Crazy wackos running around always wanting to tell you how things are going to be or how they should be, and they do nothing for the Lord. Nothing. I mean, when I say nothing, I mean nothing. But I want to criticize somebody out there trying to do something for God. How many of you met somebody like that? <laughs> <laughs> I, when I, I've, I've been to churches where the preachers is so f fanatical, and I use that term very carefully, but I know exactly what I mean when I say it. Well, they want everything. nobody on their platform 
unless they comb their hair exactly like the preachers. Well, you're in bad shape if you try to comb your hair like mine. <laughs> okay? I mean, uh, I put people in the pulpit. I've let people sing in my church. I've let people do things in my church. I know they got problems. I know, I know they got faults. I know that. I ain't worried about that. I'm trying to help them. I'm trying to help them get from point A to point B. And, and you can't, you, you, just like you can't be perfect before you get saved, you can't be necessarily perfect to do something for God or you never do nothing for God. I've had people get up in my church and do things in my church. They smoke. And somebody come in, oh, did you know someone just smokes? Yes, stupid, I know they smoke. I know a whole lot more about them than that too. And I know a whole lot about you that you didn't know I know about you. Preacher knows a lot more than you think he knows. Why don't you sit down, tend to your business, and let the preacher do things like God called him to do, okay? That's what I want to tell him. You know, these do-gooders. Trying to be spiritual. and ain't spiritual about it. You know what that is? That's a Pharisee spirit. And it comes in a church and it tries to bust the church wide open because that person don't do exactly what you do. But they hide behind these computer screens and they type because they ain't got nothing better to do. And then they got these internet churches. What is that? There's no such thing as an internet church. Just let you know that right now. That's the virtual so social distancing. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way to go to church in your pajamas. Right. That's a Christian that's lazy. <laughs> I'm just telling you, folks. I'm on a, I'm on a roll today. Now I've been praying and I've been uh, talking to the Lord, and He's been talking to me, and uh, I'm stirred up about some things about these religious people out here. They're trying to act like they're something that they're not, and they get. And I'm I'm telling you, I'm not talking about necessarily you folks here. I'm just letting you know so when it shows up, you'll recognize it. I've watched people leave church. Over stuff like that. They, these people that are super Pharisees, they'll come in and they'll start nitpicking at somebody that has just got in church. Ain't got it all together yet, but they're trying. You know what I'm saying? And this Pharisee over here will start nitpicking everything that they're doing wrong and it'll discourage them and get them out of church. I had a lady one time, I don't mind telling you this story, we worked on her for, uh, good gracious, I worked on this lady for nine weeks. She'd never been to church. You better listen to me now. I want you to hear this. And if it makes you mad, it makes you mad. If it makes you glad, I'm glad with you. But this lady, she'd never been to church. She was a young girl. She was an 18-year-old girl. And her boyfriend had never been to church. They lived together. Just so you know, they lived together. Yes, they were fornicating. I understand what that means. <laughs> something else man and, they, and I've been working on them and working on them and finally got her to church and she was pregnant and she got into church and she, she was in the service and I assured her that Jesus was glad she was there I was glad she was there and you get in here and nobody's going to make you feel out of the way and nobody's going to make you feel uncomfortable we we'll get you in here. Jesus wants to save you. Jesus wants to do something in your life, etc., etc. The first day she got there, Brother Earl, one of these hypocritical, demon-possessed, Pharisee Christians come up to her, who happened to be a pastor's wife, by the way, came up to this girl and told her, well, I just want you to know that if you're pregnant, you don't need to bother coming back here no more. That lady came up to me after church and she was crying and she said, I thought you told me God loved me and would allow me to come here like I am. You lied to me, preacher. I said, what happened to you? And she told me, and boy, you talking about Jesus going to the temple and turning over the money tables. I was ready to do it. 
I went to that pastor's wife. I got right up in her face and I told her, let me tell you something. The only Bible this girl knows is what I taught her. And you took nine weeks of working on this lady and trying to get her converted and get in a place where she could hear the word of God. You took every bit of that and you destroyed it with just two sentences. Her blood's going to be on your hands at the judgment. How do you feel about that? So what if they're not perfect? So what if they're not walking around like you think they ought to walk around? Everybody that comes to this church, I'm going to tell y'all something right now. I want y'all to hear me and hear me good. I don't care if the prostitutes, the drug addicts, the adulterers, the fornicators, the homosexuals come and sit in these pews. Don't you run them out of here. You get in there and you encourage them and you encourage them to sit under the preaching of God's word and let them hear what God says and let the preacher do his job as part as winning them to Christ and you be a support. Amen. 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 Joshua chapter 4. We're talking about the fear of the Lord. Joshua chapter 4, verse 24. Up to this point, we have said some things about the fear of the Lord that you need to recap real quick. Number one is clean. Number one is the beginning of wisdom. Number, no, excuse me, number two is the beginning of wisdom. Number three is the beginning of knowledge. Number four, it is to hate evil. Number five, it is a fountain of life. Number six is what we're going to look at today. Joshua chapter 4 verse 24. It says this. That all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord. That it is mighty. And that you might fear the Lord your God for how long? Forever. That thing is going to go out into eternity just like this book is. This book, everything this book talks about is eternal. Everything that Joe Biden talks about is temporary. Get it. Mark it down. Underline it. Everything that Joel Osteen talks about, you just throw it out the window. It's worth nothing. Amen. What God says is eternal, and he says that the fear of the Lord is going to be something you have forever. Just because you got saved don't mean that you can throw that fear out the door. Just because you're a saved Christian does not mean you're not supposed to fear God. You better fear God when everybody else around you is not afraid of him. Because there's going to come a day when they will be afraid of him. There's going to come a day when the fear of the Lord is going to get you into heaven and it's going to cause them to go to hell. Got it? It is eternal. It is forever. That's the fear of the Lord. Another thing you need to know about the fear of the Lord is it's learned. Take your Bible and go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. My amen corner is distant, but I can still hear them. <laughs> ah, them turkeys. <laughs> amen. <laughs> just call me, okay? I don't care what you call me, just call me. <laughs> amen. Amen. When, uh, you know, um, I think about the story where Jesus talked to that Syrophoenician woman and uh, she came to Jesus and he ignored her for a while and then he finally said, it's not uh, meat for me to take that which is holy and give, uh, for the children and give it to dogs. If you read that uh, scripture and study it real carefully, you know what Jesus is calling that woman? He's calling her a dog. She's a Gentile. And Jesus was not sent to the Gentiles. He was sent to the Jews. To the circumcision. And this woman got Jesus out of his dispensation and brought him over there into the dispensation of the Gentiles to heal her daughter. That's pretty amazing. Because you know what she said? He, she didn't get mad like some people would today and say, that preacher called me a name. <laughs> that preacher, he, he, he's just a mean, nasty man and all he knows how to do is talk ugly to people. She humbled herself. She recognized 
that what Jesus was saying is absolutely right, but what Jesus is saying is going to get her daughter healed. If she humbled herself, she was going to get what she came for. You better note that when you go before the Lord. Sometimes you go before the Lord arrogant. Lord, I deserve this and I deserve... You don't deserve anything. You know what you deserve? You deserve hell. You deserve a good whooping. That's what you deserve. Everything God gives you, none of it is deserved. Everything that God gives you is by His grace and through His mercy. I'm talking about you Christians out there. I'm talking about you that saved and love the Lord. When you pray and God grants you something, it's because of His grace and His mercy, not because you earned anything. Amen. If you got what you deserved, <laughs> let's talk about that for a while, shall we? You'd be in hell today. Talking about what I deserve. Uh, Deuteronomy, look at chapter 4, verse 9. Look at this. Verse 9 says this. It says, Only take heed to thyself, and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially... The day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said to me, Gather me the people together, I will make them hear my words, that they may learn, watch this now, that they may learn to what? Fear. Fear in God is a learned behavior, and you learn it by reading the words of God. Keep reading. I will make them hear my words that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth and they may teach their children. And ye came near and stood under the mountain and the mountain burned with fire into the uh, midst of heaven with darkness, clouds, and thick darkness. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the voice of the words but saw no similitude, only ye heard a voice. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon ten, uh, two tables of stone. Now what God is telling the children of Israel, what Moses is talking to them in, in, in the scriptures, is you learn to fear God by hearing the words of God. And you are supposed to teach that same fear to your children. Now, there used to be a time in this nation, and I remember growing up, I remember Grandma and Grandpa used to tell it uh, sometimes when I was sitting around when I was a young fella, you know, when it rained outside and the thunder and the lightning hit, they'd say, be quiet. Yep. That's the voice of the Lord you're hearing. People say, that's superstitious. I don't know about that, folks. The Bible says when the Lord speaks, it thundered. We might be talking a little bit more than you realized. And old timers had some wisdom that some of these young punks today don't know anything about. Because they got so educated and so scientific that they basically wrote God out of everything that's going on around them. Amen. But if you'll study the word thunder in your Bible and you'll look up the references, it's connected to God's voice many, many times. Some said it thundered when the Lord spoke. Why? Because his voice is like thunder. I like me and my wife like to get out there when it's raining and sit outside in the rain and watch the lightning and watch the thunder. It's amazing to us. We love it. I'm not afraid of it. We, we love it. We like to watch God move in this earth. You're not going to get that on Facebook. You're not going to get that with your nose stuck on Twitter or uh, Instagram or all that other stuff. You're going to really find out what God's doing in the earth by getting outside, cutting all those devices off, and getting out there and just looking at what God is doing around you in nature. Because God created this world and he created it as a testimony of who he is 
and what he is. The Bible says they are without excuse because the, the things that uh, are eternal can be seen by the things that are seen here on this earth and they testify to God. They're without excuse. If you look at nature, there's no way you can say there is no God. Not be sane. You'd be a fool to say that. There's no way you can look at this world and look at all the things and how things are made up and say there is no trinity. Because God does things in threes. And when he completes a thing, he does it in sevens. And if you look at this world and look at everything, it's done in threes and sevens, threes and sevens. And in circle, God's, God's uh, shape is a circle. When he created the throne, it's a circle. It's roundabout. If you look at that in your Bible, you'll find that word roundabout when God's doing something. So when you look out in nature and you look at that hurricane coming, what's it doing? It's going in a circle. That tornado is going in a circle. Yep. You know what? The earth spins and it's a circle. Okay. Sun's a circle. The moon's a circle. Right? Around. God's telling you something there. And when you look at nature, you can look at the trees. They're, they're, they're around like that. You cut a tree. Have y'all ever cut a square tree? Anybody? I haven't. I haven't seen a square tree. Now, I've seen what man does. Man does things in a square. So he builds a house. He builds it in a square shape like this. When God does things, he does it in a circle. That's his plan. Your cells in your body, guess what? They're circles. Your eyeballs aren't square. They ain't slanted. <laughs> They're round. Amen. Pay attention. God's teaching you something in the, in the world that you live in. And what the devil is doing, he's getting you distracted so you can't see it. Because he knows if you see it, you'll recognize that everything that's going on around you, God had to be involved in it. There's something supernatural about it. That's why they get you distracted with this stuff right here. Remember, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. Airwaves. Sonic waves, whatever you want to call it. All your electronical devices move through the air. Every one of them. Amen. All right. He says you're to teach this to your children. That's very important, folks, that your children should learn to fear God every day of their life. And when their peers come to them and say, I'm not afraid of God or I don't want to, uh, I, I I'm not scared of that uh, make-believe God you got, those children get away from them. Because they understand something. When you put it in a child, you know what a Roman Catholic says? You know what a Roman Catholic uh, school says? Give me your child the first three years of their life. And they'll, they'll stay Catholic the rest of their life. That's brainwashing. Do you know what that is? It is brainwashing, but I want you to hear something. There's truth to that. You know what you need to do with your children? You need to pour it in on when they're young. Pour it in them when they're young. Pour it in them when they're young. And when they get old, they won't forget it. And your Bible tells you that when they are old, they won't depart from it. You say, well, mine, mine got out and is doing all... I know it. I've got some children like that too. But I'm holding on to the scripture. It lets me know that they're going to come back. Did the prodigal son come back? Won't he in the father's house? Yep. Then he go out there and, and, and live like crazy in the world and realize uh, my father's servants live better than this. Amen. <laughs> he came back. But the problem with a lot of parents is they don't put it in their children when they're young. So when they're old, they reject it altogether. Take your Bible and let's look at something else. Look at 2 Chronicles 34. It's a learned behavior. But it's supernatural. 
Second Chronicles 34. And look at verse 14, and we're going to read a few verses here. I'm going to give you some examples here, and then we'll go back into Deuteronomy again. Second Chronicles 34, 14. The Bible says in verse 14, And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. And Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaphan. And Shaphan carried the book to the king and brought the king word back again, saying, All that was committed to thy servants, they do it. And they have gathered together the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hand of the overseers and to the hand of the workmen. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law that he rent his clothes. That's a good response. That's a man that is responding to the words of God being read to him. And he's responding in a way that God wants him to. What's he doing? He's repenting. The Bible says, And the king commanded Hilkiah and Anakin, the son of Shaphan, and Abdon. Aren't you glad your name's Mark? The son of Micah, and Shaphan, the scribe, and Asi, a servant of the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. They're concerned. And Hilkiah, and they that the king had appointed, went to Hilkiah, the pro, uh, excuse me, Hoda the prophetess, the wife of Shulam, the son of Tukvath, and son of Harsha, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, and they spake to her to that effect. And she answered them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell ye the man that sent you to me. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the curses that are written in the book, which they have read before the king of Judah. Because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be poured out upon this place and shall not be quenched. As for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, so shall ye say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel concerning the words which thou hast heard, Because thy heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself before God, when thou heardest his words against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, and humble thyself before me, and did rend thy clothes, and weep before me, I have, get, I have even heard thee, saith the Lord." Behold, I will gather thee to thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace. Neither shall thine eyes see all the evil that I will bring upon this place and upon the inhabitants of the same. So shall they brought the king word again. Then the king sent and gathered together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests and the Levites and all the people great and small. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant that was found in the house of the Lord. Lord, and the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant which are written in this book and caused all that were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to stand to it. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers. And Josiah took away all the abominations out of the countries that pertain to the children of Israel and made all that were present in Israel to serve, even to serve the Lord their God. And all his days they departed not from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. You know what they did? They heard God's words. They took it seriously. They got out there and they got rid of the filth and the demon-possessed stuff that had corrupted them. And they turned back to God with all their heart and with all their soul. That's the fear of the Lord, folks. We read that earlier. The fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. It's not to embrace it. It's not to sit there and say, well, you know, um, you know, to each his own. No. When we read in this book where God says something, 
We have an obligation to abide by it. Amen. When we read in this book that God tells you, get rid of the idols, we ought to get rid of the idols. The idols in our life that are keeping us from serving God like we ought to. Now that idol can be a lot of things. And it can be different things for different people. But when a man fears God, he hears God's words, he takes heed to them, and he obeys them. And he gets all the clutter out of his life that keeps him from obeying them. That's the fear of the Lord. That's an example. Now look at Deuteronomy. Again, chapter 14. Deuteronomy chapter 14. And look at verse 33. That's not right. I'm sorry. Verse 23. That's, that's the wrong Bible, ain't it, brother? <laughs> Deuteronomy 14, 23. I was waiting for Brother Jack to speak up on that one. What kind of Bible are you reading there? <laughs> All right. Deuteronomy 14, 23. <laughs> That's the new and improved Mark Anderson version. <laughs> yeah, and that's the commentary version. There you go. Uh, verse 23, the Bible says, And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn and thy wine and of thy oil and the firstlings of thy herds and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. God put, and this goes back to the local church. The church of Jesus Christ is an organism. That's the spiritual body of believers that come together and are born again and placed in the body of Christ. That is the spiritual church. But there is also what is called the local church. And God instituted that local church for your benefit. And it is to teach you the Word of God and is put there to encourage you in the things of God and help you to fear God on a daily basis. The local church is important. Jesus Christ set it up. Not Mark Anderson. So when these knuckleheads get out here and say, I can serve God without going to church. We know you can. And how's that going for you? How's that working out for you today? I'm not knocking it. I'm saying there's times when you are in certain places now and there's certain countries where you can't go to a local assembly. It's illegal. But you know what those believers do there? They still assemble. They do it in private. I had a missionary come back from uh, China. I'm going to try to get some uh, missionaries in here soon to talk to you. Uh, in some of these places, and he was in China. You know what they have to do over there? They have to rent uh, apartments over there where they where they live at, and they have to take flashlights and read their Bibles in the dark, or the communist police uh, forces over there, if they raid those places, they take them off to re-education camps. And those people still assemble. And you know what they tell us when they come over here? I don't understand. All these people that profess to be Christians in America... Why so few churches are full. Y'all have the opportunity to freely meet and freely assemble. And yet, when you go in church after church after church, Bible-believing churches, by the way. I'm talking about Bible-believing churches. They're half empty. Why is that? They're small. Why is that? There's so many people professing to be saved. Where, where's your, where's your uh, action with your words? Words were very cheap if they're not met with action. Amen. 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 Yeah. I tell my wife I love her, but I beat her all the time. Do you think that, that me telling her I love her means anything? No, it don't mean nothing. Actually, I'm saying the opposite by my actions. If I love my wife, I'm going to cherish her. I'm going to love her. I'm going to uh, communicate with her. I'm going to do things with her. I'm going to give her that physical knowledge of knowing that what my words say, my actions match that. And when you say you love God, 
and you say you love the Lord and you want to do what God wants you to do, but yet you refuse to obey God on the simple things like coming and being assembled in the assembly with other believers when you can, that is a problem. Amen. I love the Lord, but you never pray. What do you think my wife would do if I... Uh, <laughs> I told her I loved her once a year and I didn't talk to her the rest of the year. <laughs> That's the way some Christians are. That's the way some Christians are with their relationship with God. They never talk to Him. They never talk to Him. They don't ever pray. <laughs> Prayers for the preacher. <laughs> some of them think that, you know. The only one that's got a line with God's the preacher. No. <laughs> You're supposed to pray. You're supposed to get on your knees before God and, and, and ask God for things and, and pray about things that's going on in your life and ask God to help you get through things. It's not just a preacher's job. We all ought to be in prayer together. Here's another one. I love the Lord. But I never picked this book up. That's a problem. That's God's love letter to you. That's the instruction book. What would you think if I said I was a pilot of a 747, but I never read the instruction manual? Would you get in the plane with me? I don't think so. If you do, you're brave. <laughs> we might go up, but I promise you, we're coming down. <laughs> and we're probably not going to land where you want to land. <laughs> We're going to land, all right. Yeah, we're going to land, but it ain't going to be the way you think. That's the way some Christians are, folks. They love God, but they never pick this book up. They never study this book. They never get in the Word of God that they need to hear. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Preachers, listen, we need to get into some good preaching. Not just one preacher. A bunch of different good preachers. There's a lot of good preachers out there. I've recommended some to you. Uh, Brother Peacock, he's a good one. Uh, Brother Brother Kim, he's a good one. He's got some good teaching. Brother Ruckman, he's got some good teaching. Brother Breaker, he's got some good teaching. Brother Don Knotts, he's got some good preaching. I'm Look, I am not jealous of preachers. Okay? I am not uh, threatened by them. I want you to get under some good preaching. Okay? Because it's that... Uh, communion with other voices that are preaching the same gospel and preaching out the same book where we can grow in the Lord. Because I promise you, Don don't have it all. Ruckman don't have it all. Brother Donovan don't have it all. Brother Kim don't have it all. There's going to be some things that Brother Kim brings up that Brother Don didn't bring up and vice versa. So when you hear and you pull that in, you can grow in the Lord with those things. See, there's some things I teach that I've never heard anybody preach and teach on. <laughs> Amen, sister. <laughs> Amen. Good or bad, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> hopefully it's good. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but you know what it is? You get in the Word of God. You let the Word of God mold you. You let the Word of God shape you. And everything that we've read in these verses this morning, what's the big thing that they all have in common? They heard the words that they might learn to fear. That's it. That's how it works. Let's look at another one. Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17. Yes. Deuteronomy 17, 18. I love this one. I got this one marked all kinds of ways in one of my Bibles. I got stars and underlined and highlighted and and uh, <laughs> circled. Uh, when I was younger um, and first getting in in the things of the Lord after I got first got saved, uh, I used to take Sister Carolyn's Bible and I was amazed at how wore out that Bible was. <laughs> that Bible was wore out. Now she still got that Bible somewhere. And it is wore out. She had notes running across notes. 
<laughs> I mean, there was notes, and then there was notes on top of those notes, and you'd have to translate, you know, <laughs> and try to figure out what note went, went with what. I like stuff like that. That's a person that's in it to win it. They're in it, and they're studying, and they want to know what God says, and when God speaks, they write out. You get in my my Bibles, I, I, they're marked up pretty good too. You ought to mark your Bible. You ought to highlight it. You ought to make notes. When God shows you things, you ought to write it in there. But listen to what God tells this king here. Verse 18. And it, can, it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priest, the Levites. And it shall be with him and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children, and in the midst of Israel. I think that ought to be a law that every senator, every congressman, every president, and every vice president that comes into office in this country ought to be made to do. Their first job, their first duty ought to be to start with Genesis and write all the way through the book of Revelation, handwrite it, and have it sitting beside their office. Amen. That's what the king of Israel was required to do. He was required to write the first five books of the law, handwrite it, not type it, not get with uh, one of these dragon programs and process. And, 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 and process it and uh, speak and it would print it out for you. He was to handwrite it. And when he finished handwriting it, he was to sit it beside his throne and he was to read in that thing all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and he was to use that book and judge everything according to it. Now, if we had some people in America today in positions of power that did that, we'd be in a whole lot better shape than what we are right now. Amen. If we had some preachers that would do that in pulpits today, we would have some good stuff going on. Amen. You know why God told, you know, now God will not tell you to do something that he himself is not going to do. Take your Bible and look at Revelation. Chapter 20. Now God told the king of Israel to do this. You know why he told him to do it? Because he himself did it. He told that king to have, a, have the book beside the throne, didn't he? Yep. All right, look at verse 12. The Bible says, I saw the dead small and great stand before God and what? Books. The books. How many books are in your Bible? 66. All 66 laying right there by the throne. When a man goes to the great white throne, judgment lost and undone without Jesus Christ. God Almighty goes and starts in Genesis, the book of Genesis. He finds everything that they broke in Genesis. He moves right along to each book of that Bible and everything that they committed wrong and contrary to the word of God. He goes all the way through the book of Revelation. He judges them by everything that they were told to do that they didn't do. He judges them according to their works. Don't believe it? Keep reading the Bible says, And I saw the dead, small, and great stand before God. The books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. It didn't say he judged them according to the book of life. It says he judged them according to the books. And keep reading. According to their what? What did it say? They're not saved by grace. <laughs> They're judged by their works. And if you ever stand before God and he judges you according to your works, you're in trouble. Yeah, big time. <laughs> this group here he is. Did you notice something about this group too? Did you notice that none of them were alive? Look at verse 12 again. I saw the what? Dead. The what? Dead. They're not alive. They're spiritually dead. 
How about that? The people that wind up at the great white throne judgment are dead spiritually. And when they get before God, God's going to take this book and find them guilty in Genesis, uh, Deuteronomy, Numbers, Leviticus, Exodus. He's going to go through the whole thing. And by the time he gets done with them, they're going to say, I deserve hell. They're going to be speechless. They're not going to be able to say anything. And God's going to judge them according to their works. Whosoever was not found, verse 15, written in the book of life. That's you and me. Our names are in the book of life. This group here was not. So the books were opened. You got two choices, people. You can either have your name in the book of life and go to heaven, which is far better. Or you can take your chances and be judged according to the books. Have your pick. But you will be judged. And when he gets done with you, <clears throat> you won't be no arguments. You won't get up there and tell God, I'm going to straighten him out. No, he's going to straighten you out. There won't be no... Uh, ACLU up there pleading your cause because they're being judged too. There won't be no fancy attorneys like Cochran that lied and swindled and are corrupt and got uh, OJ off the uh, hook for murder when everybody knows he did it. There won't be no crooked lawyers up there that Gets you in a situation where you can get out there and do some more drugging like King, Rodney King, and wind up doing uh, dying in a, in a pool because of a drug overdose. The righteous judge is going to judge you according to this book right here. And you better come out on top or you're going down. All right. What time is it? Don't matter. Don't matter. <laughs> All right, got a few more minutes here. Let's look at Deuteronomy 31. Deuteronomy 31. One thing you can always count on when you're out there um, street preaching. You can rest assured one thing. Those demons <laughs> that are in people are going to manifest themselves, buddy. They're going to tell you exactly what they think of you. <laughs> people that probably didn't say a harsh word to anybody, boy, they were rolling them wings down, <laughs> screaming and hollering, and they probably didn't even know what they were saying. I've watched them, man, over the years. I've watched them just, their whole demeanor changes. They don't even know what they're mad at. They just know they're mad. <laughs> this book will bring it out of you, man. Deuteronomy 31, verse 12. Look at this. i close with this one. The Bible says, Gather the people together, men and women, children, and, the, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear. But other than that, that means nobody's accepted. That means everybody is to hear what you've got to say, including the stranger. People come to your house to visit on Sunday morning. They go to church with you. Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. They hear that they may learn. And what? Fear. The Lord thy God, your God. And observe to do all the what? Words of this law. There you go. And that their children which have not known anything, they're dumb, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land whether you go over Jordan to possess it. Parents, it's your job to put that fear of God in their hearts. They're not going to have that fear if they don't hear it. 
They're not going to have that fear if they don't see mom and daddy leading by example. It's not do as I say, it's do as I do. Amen, amen, amen. You just, I, I know these dads I've had to deal with when I'm out uh, doing personal work. And, and, and they'll try to send their uh, children and their wife off to church, but church ain't for them. Listen, bud, you got it wrong. You better go and get in church, and then they'll follow you to church. Amen. Mama ain't going to go to church if daddy ain't going to go. And guess what? A little junior ain't going to go if mom and daddy ain't there. Right. Mm -hmm. You all got to go together. Dad is the head of the home, no matter what Janet Reno says, and Dad is the one that's going to be held accountable. It don't matter what Biden says. <laughs> Whoopi Goldberg and all the rest of them can take a flying hot and walk a long walk off a short pier. They'd do the nation a favor if they did that. They're corrupting this nation in a way that you can't even imagine spiritually. Words have power. Don't ever forget that. Words have power. And Jesus Christ said that you will be judged by every idle word that comes out of your mouth. So, dad needs to pull his shoe laces and bootstraps up and let's get going. You want your children in church? Be in church. You want your children reading the Bible? You read the Bible. You want your children praying? Let them see you praying. Matter of fact, have prayer with them. I take Samuel to school. When I, when it's, when I take him to school, and I wind up going sometimes to take him to school, I pray with him on the way to school. Come on, Samuel, let's pray. I'm going to pray for you to have a good day at school. Let's pray. Now, you know what he did to start with? Little resistance, you know, pulling the hand away, you know, around, 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 around. Give me that hand, boy. <laughs> We're we'll getting ready to pray. We'll be praying over food sometimes, and he'll try to sneak some food in the mouth. Boy, I'll slap that food right out your mouth and praise God while I'm doing it. <laughs> we got to teach them by example. Don't do as I say, do as I do. That's the, that's the rule. Look at what he says here. Verse 13. That their children which have not known anything may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land whether you go over Jordan to possess it. I want my children in church because I want them to hear the gospel and I want that gospel message to get down inside their heart and even if it doesn't convert them today, they're somewhere down the road. They're going to remember and hear their daddy preaching when they're out there on the street somewhere. And they're going to have those messages haunt them until they get right with God. That's what I want. I want them saved. Noah, when he's out there preaching... The Bible didn't say he was trying to preach to get them in, the people on the outside in. But he got his family in. Eight souls. They probably weren't even living right. <laughs> but they knew that daddy was doing something that was important. And when they paid attention to what daddy was doing, they got in there and helped daddy do it because he led by example. He didn't say, hey, go build an ark. Come here, son. I'm going to show you how we're going to build this art together. Because there's rain coming. There's rain coming. What is that? they never seen it rain. What are you talking about, Daddy? Daddy's lost his mind. He's talking about rain. What is rain? Just trust me, son. It's coming. I've heard from God, and God told me it's going to rain. And it's not going to be any kind of rain that has ever, ever been seen or ever shall be seen again. It's going to destroy this whole world. But you know what? Before they believe it, you got to believe it. Amen. They can't sit there and hear you sitting around the dinner table doubting God. Why should they believe? You don't. Amen. Fear of the Lord is learned. 
And we'll stop right there. Anybody got any questions? I got a, I got a question. Where's my pencil? <laughs> no, we'll start at Second Kings next week. We're gonna we're gonna go on a little further with this thing about learning the fear of the Lord. There's some more on this message here. I feel like you need to get. So we're gonna get going, get going with it. Yes, sir. Eight souls. It was. That was it. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Only eight souls. That's what the Bible says. Eight souls. That's right. Shem, Ham, and Japheth were on that ark, and their wives. Yep. And they repopulated the whole world in obedience to what God told them in Genesis chapter 9. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish. Same thing God told Adam. Replenish. I didn't say plenish like the new Bible say. I said replenish. Do you know what re means? It means to do over something that was here before. That tells you there was something in Genesis chapter 1 that was there before Adam that got destroyed. That's right. Exactly what that means. That means there was a world here, there was a kingdom here, and there was a ruler here, and his name was Lucifer. And he had a race of beings that he was ruling over. And they had the same opportunity Adam and Eve had. They were in that garden, and I'm, I'm getting off on something, but I'll just... Give you something to think about until next week. They were in that garden. They had opportunity to get to the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God told them the same thing he told Adam and Eve. Don't go to this tree over here. Go to this tree over here. But guess what they did? They ate off both trees. They ate off the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then they went to the tree of life and ate off of it. That's why they couldn't be redeemed. Whereas Adam could be redeemed because God stopped him from eating the tree of life. If they'd ate off that tree of life, they'd have been in a fallen state forever and Jesus couldn't have come and redeemed them. That's what happened with Satan. He couldn't be saved. Why? He ate off both trees. Think about that for a while. Anybody else got any questions? Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your blessings today. Take these things we've studied out of your word today, apply them in our hearts, and uh, use them for the glory of God, and meditate upon them, and think upon them, and help us, Lord, as we go out of this place, keep us safe until we come together again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you today for coming. We appreciate you. We love you. And uh, Lord willing, we're going to be ready here soon. Brother Chuck is working just as hard as he can on this communion stuff. Uh, as soon as he gets it all typed out, I'll review it. And me and uh, some of the brethren will get in here and uh, go through it a couple of times. And then we'll be ready to present it to the church. And we'll start having communion service on Sunday nights. Until we get to that point, though, we're not going to do it. Because we want to make sure everything's exactly the way it needs to be. All right. Thank you again, guys. Oh, there's food in the back. There's donuts. There's biscuits please grab something on the way out ma works really hard to get that stuff to us um thank you mom